The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Holy, holy God, all the earth is full of your majesty. The rains fall as a reminder of your gentle refreshment. The sun shines in testimony to the warmth of your love. All creation is your temple. None can hide from you. Expose to your grandeur and led by your spirit. We give you all praise and honor. Let us worship God. Now let us confess what we believe using the great ancient words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick in the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
us take a moment to greet each other in the name of Jesus Christ. <clears throat>
so much. I want to turn now to the Gospel of John. And there we find these words. Beginning in the 14th chapter. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and will, we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and, and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Some of the disciples said to another, What does he mean? In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. And because I am going to the Father, they kept asking, What does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. This is the word of the Lord.
Let us turn now uh, to God for a moment of silent prayer. Amen. English mystery writer Dorothy Sayers, she was also a lay theologian in the Church of England. She was on a trip uh, doing some research um, on a, one of her books, and she was uh, in the Orient, and she was talking to a group of Christians, and they were, she was trying to explain something that every minister struggles to explain and that is the Trinity. One of the Oriental gentlemen was kind of lost in this maze of theology when coming to understand what the Trinity said. He said, honorable father, I understand. Honorable son, I understand. Honorable bird, I don't understand. <laughs> I think we uh, understand that too. He's not alone. Uh, George Bernard Shaw once said that all professions are conspiracies against the laity. Nowhere does this seem to be more true than in the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We say it at every worship service. It's part of our, our, our texture. It's there. Every uh, Bob, Bob is here. Bob, remember in seminary when you had to come up with your own statement of faith, right? Everybody is supposed to do this before you uh, apply to become a pastor. You have to show them your statement of faith. Every one of them. And there are thousands of ministers, and every single one of them tries to replicate the Apostles' Creed. Simple as that. Everybody tries. Did you? Yeah, that's what I did. I took it. Like, how do you reword this so you're not being plagiaristic of the Lord Jesus Christ? I mean, there's got to be some way, somewhere in between to understand. And the, the Apostles' Creed is essentially a Trinitarian creed. If I believe in God the Father. I believe in the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. It's all there. Take a look. And we talk about it. But do we really understand what it means? Because it's very difficult. It's a difficult concept. The Holy Spirit, in particular, is difficult. The words are part of the ritual of uh, every Christian body in the world. Everywhere you go, you find Christians using this same language about God in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But what do these words mean? Are they merely theological mumbo jumbo designed to confuse people? Or do they point to something that is real, something that is important? For most of us, they are a means of dealing with just who God is, the nature of God. 98% of the American people, according to recent polls, say that they believe in God in some way, shape, or form. It can mean everything, and it can mean nothing. But for many people, that belief is sort of a vague notion about someone in the great somewhere, you know, or, or as I heard one guy say, you know, I just, uh, the man upstairs. Well, it's uh, okay. Well, however you want to describe God, there's a lot of ways to do it. But a lot of people, God is nothing more than a vast oblong blur. C.S. Lewis once wrote of a girl he, that he knew who said that the, the word God reminded her of tapioca pudding. Just a vast tapioca pudding. The only problem was that she didn't like tapioca pudding. So <laughs> get it. But it makes tremendous difference what sort of God we believe in. And, and these days when religious fanatics threaten the world, and they come from every corner of the world, Christian extremists, Jewish zealots, Muslim fanatics, all claiming to have some higher knowledge of God, we have come to realize, if we didn't know it before, that belief in God is not enough. The question is, what sort of God do we believe in? I'll give you a pretty practical example of this. <coughs> A man named Lynn Green ran the local hardware store in Auburndale. He was very upset one day when he came in and uh, when I came into his, his store, and he said, "I can't believe what's happened at the school. My my granddaughter. It was uh, the the day of uh, Halloween. Uh, her teacher told her that if she dresses up and goes out to get candy, that she's worshiping Satan. No, that seems pretty audacious for a teacher to say that, right? <laughs> Would you find that slightly offensive? I know Halloween is Halloween." This little kid, little, little child, really. I said, well, Lynn, remember a couple of uh, months ago you were complaining because you thought that prayer needed to be back in school? And he said, yeah, it should be. I said, who's going to pray it? That teacher or you? Do you see the difference? Do you see the problem? It depends on what kind of God you understand, what kind of, of uh, experience that you have with God. 
Now, in just a few uh, weeks, we will be celebrating Pentecost. It's the day that the the Holy Spirit came upon the church, and we we, uh, understand this, you know, in rich and, and deep ways. But God continues to reveal himself to the church today. He didn't just do it back then, but he does it every day. Early in the life of the Christian church, it was found necessary to speak of God to help people to understand God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And around the year 55 AD, Paul wrote two letters to the church of Corinth. And the second one, he wrote, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We've started our worship service with those words today. And I imagine Paul would have been surprised if someone had told him back that those words would become official blessings of, or benediction used in, in, uh, universally by the Christian church for 2,000 years. But those words sum up the essence of the Christian faith. We believe that because of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have come to know the love of God and in through the fellowship of the community of the Holy Spirit, which is the church. And so we sing, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, God in three persons, perfect Trinity, blessed Trinity. And does that mean we believe in three gods, three individual? And they say, this, this stuff is good. And literally, we spent weeks and weeks on seminary on this until my head exploded and I had to have glued back together. This is tough theology. But, but it, emphatically, we do not believe in three separate gods. The doctrine of the Trinity was set forth to, in an effort to preserve the unity of God. If you have any friends who are, and they love to do this, Jehovah's Witnesses, who will uh, ask you questions. Well, sure, you want to talk about the Bible? Yeah, the first question they ask you is, where's the Trinity in the Bible? Well, do you know where it is? It's not. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. The the concept of the Trinity is you have to take it from lots of different places to come up with it. It is there, but there's no word that says, and then the Trinity said so-and-so. So So it's, it's, it's a difficult thing out there. It was not developed by theologians who were living aloof from the world in some ivory tower, but it came out of the day-to-day experiences of Christians. And as good Jews, they believed in one God, but they had experienced the presence of this one God visiting them in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus, the Christ, the anointed one, the revealer of God. And when Jesus was no longer with them in the flesh, they did not feel that God had left them. Indeed, Jesus himself told them, it is to your advantage that I go away. I will send the counselor to you, the Holy Spirit. I have been with you. I shall be in you. We believe that this is the supreme revelation of God. And as a man, Jesus could only be in one place at a time. And that place was Palestine, a little country, some 50 by 150, smaller than Massachusetts, about the size of New Jersey, of all things. Christians believe that the Holy Spirit universalized Jesus. Through the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ is more alive to millions more people today than he ever was in that first three decades of the first century. And of course, the Trinity, while it is a deep mystery, theologians have spent lifetimes spraining their brains trying to understand it. But what we do understand is that God plays different roles on the stage of human history. God is the creator, God is the redeemer, God is the sustainer. We might say that the doctrine of the Trinity describes God's progressive efforts to get closer to us, to get closer. Not content to be above, God came to walk beside us. Not content to be that God now dwells within us. And that is what we say when we say that we believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, as Yale professor Halford Lukak used to say, is God in the present tense. I'll let that roll over you. That's deep. God in the present tense. I was at a uh, a presbytery meeting some time back. It was meeting at a a local uh, church not too far from here. And I looked up, and behind the choir was this beautiful stained glass. It was lovely, but it had the um, Holy Spirit as a bird. And I wondered to myself, would non-Christians think that we worship a bird? That we worship that? It's confusing. Outside a big Pentecostal church over near Auburndale, there is a a dove, and it is huge. It's the size of a truck. And the children in our church used to refer to it. We're going to go down by the, uh, the church down by the big pigeon. 
Holy Spirit is not something that we understand, but it is a reality that we share. But what does the Holy Spirit do? That, that is the question that makes this doctrine relevant to your life and mine. The Holy Spirit makes God real in our lives today. The King James Version calls the Holy Spirit the comforter. There's an old story of a seminary student in Edinburgh who had a, a top typographical error on one of his papers, and he was trying to say, the Lord has taken away our guilt, but somehow he misspelt it, and it said, the Lord has taken away our quilt. And the professor said, well, that's okay, because he's promised us a comforter. Yeah. <laughs> I can't make this up. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not a bad word, the comforter. It, it comes from two Latin words. It means one who stands beside us to give us strength. And again, who is to doubt that the church and all of us who are within the church could use a little extra portion of spiritual strength? One of the nicknames given to the Methodists was the enthusiasts. It was not intended to be a compliment. They were looked upon as being weirdos. Imagine people who sought to live their lives completely under the direction of the Holy Spirit. The word enthusiasm comes from the Greek word which means to be in God. I love enthusiastic people. Most people couldn't get enough enthusiasm going in their lives to dislodge their neckties. But people that have enthusiasm actually live. A man in California was visiting with a friend of mine, and he was, when he walked in, he saw my friend was playing cards with his dog. And the man was amazed. He says, your, your dog can play cards. And his friend said, yeah, but he's not very good. Every time he gets a good hand, his tail wags. <laughs> yeah. But you may not be aware of it. And I, before I, I started preaching when I it wasn't I was pretty young when all this started to happen but I spent all my life in the pews and I thought you, uh, the preacher couldn't see me <laughs> it's kind of like if you're a teacher the students don't think you can, they can see you either yeah no they can see you just fine and I can see all of you I know if you're sitting in the right place or if you're not you know I can see if you're nodding off a little bit or not you know I get I get all of that but I can also see your tails wagging in a way I mean not literally I, I, I hope but but uh, I can see it in your face. There used to be a lady that was a, a staunch Pentecostalist in our church in Columbia, South Carolina. She had been a Bible teacher her whole life. Amazing woman, really amazing. Very conservative. And, and I tended to agree with her on her, her theological bends because I'm pretty conservative. But she would sit right about where you are, right there. And I knew I was doing okay if I looked over at her and she was doing this. Yeah, she was listening. She, she said, I'm praying for you the whole time you're preaching. I said, thank you. That's great. And so she's doing this. I felt good. But boy, she did this. I was worried. I was like, oh, no, no. But I will tell you that each of you, that you're, you're like that, that little dog wagging your tail. I can see if you're connecting, if you're listening. It's that enthusiasm that is so infectious. There was a, a meeting of, of the Ministerial Association. They were going to plan a, a big a revival in town. It was going to be a, a huge deal. And every church was going to contribute something. Some were going to contribute food. Some were going to contribute music and all that. And they came to the Presbyterian pastor and he said, well, what, is the, what are the Presbyterians going to contribute? He says, restraint. <laughs> yeah. The presence of Christ, though, in our lives, in our church, in our world, makes a difference. We are supposed to be a fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Someone once suggested that around any given church, there might be drawn three circles, three fellowships an outer circle, a middle circle, and an inner circle. Now, in the outer circle are those whom religion is a little, well, maybe a little bit more than a routine. It's more of a burden than a blessing, but they carry it. It doesn't carry them. As Henry, uh, Harry Emerson Fostick once said, some people have just enough religion to make themselves miserable. I've known people like that. They they attend church occasionally. They drop a few dollars in the offering plate once in a while. They call on the church for weddings, funerals, baptisms. But they are living on the edge of the Christian life. And that's tragic. This group is very large. A pastor was typing the creed and intentionally was typing. Uh, he, he was meant to mean to, to type, I believe in the Holy Spirit. But he inadvertently typed, I believe in the Holy Spirit. A lot of people, their religion is just a matter of holy spurts. It's just a burst of activity. Christmas, Easter, a little maybe in between. 
pro preacher one so a time stood at the grocery store and introduced himself to a fellow that was in line. He said, yep, I'm the pastor at uh, First Presbyterian Church up uh, the way there. And to the pastor's amazement, the man said, oh, well, that's great. It's good to know. I'm a member of First Presbyterian Church up the street. But the pastor said, I've been there for six months, and all that time I've never seen you in church. And the man said, I said I was a member, not a fanatic. <laughs> okay, these are the people in the outer circle. The middle circle are those who have some sort of religious experience somewhere along the line. They attend church fairly regularly and contribute well. They're essentially good people, but their religion doesn't have much joy in it or much power in it. They go through the motions, but there's something missing. They have a deep longing for something more, something deeper. They have a, a hunch that maybe they might be missing something, but they don't know what it is or where to go and get it. And this group's pretty large, not as large as the first group but pretty large. And then there's that third group, the inner circle. These are the people in every congregation that's blessed with them for whom religion is a reality and not merely a ritual. They're in touch with deep resources of the Christian faith. They know what it is to have a personal relationship with God in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. Now that inner circle term sounds pretty snobbish I, and I don't really care for it. It sounds almost elitist, but the God proclaimed in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ stands with outstretched arms to welcome everyone. If anyone is outside this inner circle of God's love, it's ser seriously because that's what they choose. An old retired minister who'd spent most of his lifetime preaching in the church once said, George, you know, I think it would be a good idea if every church burns down every hundred years. Now, what he was talking about was people who cannot let go of the past. And, and I've, I've been in pet churches like that. The first thing that they tell you when you come in as a visitor is the history of the church. And that's not a bad thing. Every church has history. But can any of you tell us the history of this church? I can't even tell you that because it's so hard to find out. But if you want to know what's happening this week, well, that's easy because everybody will tell you that. It's a church that has found that the living today, the Holy Spirit moving us today, is the reality that we live. Not what happened 20 years ago, or 50 years ago, or 150 years. This church has been around a long time. Thank God for that. That's wonderful. But that's not the reality of our church. The reality is the Holy Spirit moving in you today. Today. Think about that. I think that perhaps it would, if, if the church were to burn down all the churches, maybe they would burn out the laziness and pettiness and selfishness and half-heartedness and lukewarmness and give the world a sample of what a spirit-filled people really look like. People that are filled instead with love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all of these things, a people of God's purpose living and working in the world today. So what is a trinity? It is the expression of a believing people who are struggling to understand God, how God moves among us and lives within us. It's a way of expressing that which is inexpressible, but nonetheless a reality of God active in our lives. And I say that in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And in that we find our best understanding of God. Let us pray. Our Father, we are, we have these theological words that we think we know what they mean, and we don't. But what we have is you in our lives, calling us and creating around us and allowing us to be the people that you call us to be. You allow that spirit to move us as a fellowship and as individuals. So today we welcome that. Today we recognize the movement of the Holy Spirit through this church, through its leaders and its members, through the music and all of the different ministries and mission of the church, all of it expressions of the Holy Spirit's enthusiasm. We thank you for that as we embrace it once again. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Let us give to God now our tithes and offerings.
you guys look scared. <laughs> have you done this before? Or no? You haven't? Okay. It's not bad, I promise. None of them bite except that one in the back there. Goes down the line. We're good. <laughs> Goodness. Please remain standing. Is that 
it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love. And on and on. gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love. In death, in life, here. This is for Don Snow, right? Make sure I get this right, okay? Because your handwriting is excellent, but my reading is not. Um, Don will be coming home tomorrow um, on Monday to continue his recuperation with physical therapy coming for a while longer. And thank you in capital letters for all your prayers and cards. Uh, we are truly blessed. So that's wonderful. I'm so glad. Yeah, it really is. God bless him. Um, this seems like there's a, been a large amount of violence uh, in our communities uh, recently. Shootings, mass shootings, just some crazy, just stuff. And one of the things that I'm working on a sermon on is the amount of anger that seems to be in uh, our society. People are just angry and they don't even know what uh, to be angry at. So we need to pray for that and need to pray for, for peace. Uh, course around the world and particularly in the Ukraine. I had a touch of that this week. I had a desk to get rid of. It was so big nobody would take it. It was seven feet long. It's like a coffin. It's huge. And I, I set it out in front of my house and put a it's free sign on it and put it on Marketplace. And a nice young couple came and they were speaking in Russian and um, could tell the difference uh, a little bit. But uh, I said, so where are you from? And they're from the Ukraine. And uh, she's a nurse uh, studying to get her license here in the United States. So I got touched by that a little bit. We had a, a chat and uh, they're religious people and I told them I would lift them up in prayers this week as well. So do that. And uh, are there any others that we can? Okay, hold on a second. I got one back here. Faith. You gotta say it loud now because I'll hear it.
And they just found out when her orthopedic that was on medical leave came back, he checked the femur bone. All the screws apparently came loose, and it was not done correctly. She has to have a bleed broken and start all over. Oh my goodness, yeah, okay. Did you all get that? Okay, she has a, a friend of hers that's been a, um, a friend since they were children. She fell down the stairs and broke her femur, and the doctor went away, and when he came back, it had not taken right, and she's going to have to re-break it and fix it. So. But she is a woman of great faith. She never, she has been, you know, God's with me, and she's just a woman. So good. She has a woman of great faith. Sally? Um, you mentioned By the way, thank you for singing today. It was a beautiful song. Mosaic of Peace, the Peace USA. Any others? Let's turn our thoughts to God. Oh God, we confess that too often we are the ones who are poor in spirit. We are the ones who mourn the losses in our lives. We are the ones who hunger and thirst for justice and righteousness and truth in our world. And you offer blessings to us in our yearnings, and yet we often miss your loving presence. We get caught up so much in our own circumstances, and at times we question where the blessing can be in the midst of all of the despair, sadness, emptiness, and anxiety that is felt inside and out. Yet, we yearn for you. We yearn deeply for you. So have mercy upon us, O God, and lead us beyond our weaknesses. Lift, lift us above our doubts and help us to see the healing and forgiveness that you continually make available to us. Help us to have strength in the midst of our struggles and to be open enough to receive your blessings. As recipients of your blessing in love and grace, we are called to share your blessings with other of your children. And so we lift our prayers for ourselves and on the behalf of others. We pray for those who are heavily burdened we pray especially for those who have lost jobs or are worried about employment. Gently bind their wounds. Renew our hearts in dedication to your will and send your spirit upon all of your children who are hurting or in special need. We give thanks for your presence in all the created world. May we find you in the sorrowing and in the poor and empower us to be a light to the world and salt of the earth. Look with favor on all who trust in your grace and love and fill each of us with the blessing of mind, body, and spirit. Gentle and holy God, help us to be patient and to take time to find you in our everyday lives. Help us to look to the ordinary, to find your blessing in lost coins and widow's mites and mustard seeds. Help us to find the holy in relationships that are healed in hope that is restored and the chance that is ours to begin again. You are a holy and a wondrous God, ready to satisfy the yearnings of our hearts if only we will listen and be silent. We have been drawn together into this place and in this time and done so in the name of Jesus Christ and we give you thanks for your renewing presence every day. Hear us now as we join our voices together in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please, let's stand and sing this great old gospel song. Goodness, where's Audrey? Where's Audrey? Where? Oh, yeah, I gotta get here early to get it. Audrey, happy birthday. I, we did. Let's sing happy birthday.
understand? <clears throat> before, you, <clears throat> before you go from this place, know that God goes with you. And that the Holy Spirit moves among this church and among you and in your life today and every day. And share that with a world that does not understand that. And certainly doesn't embrace it because they don't know the Holy Spirit. They don't know the Spirit of God. But you can share it with them. So that's your job. <laughs> it's a pretty big job. Before you leave, though, start with those who have been worshiping with you on your pew and welcome them and say hello And before we all head out of here. And I will look forward to seeing you again soon and hope that God's blessing is with you. So receive now the benediction of our Lord Jesus Christ as he goes before you and follows after you and leads you along the way until at last we are all safely in his home. <laughs>